Class is dismissed, boys and girls. <laughs> Previously on the YTV Retrospective. Romamu, I've come to bargain. Check this out. hasn't heard of Lego. I have it! Not scientifically possible! Of course everyone has heard of Lego. The little toy bricks that can build amazing vehicles, buildings, or anything beyond imagination. This toy has been a success around the globe since 1949. Video games, amusement parks, full stores devoted to the little 2x2 brick. It is a juggernaut. But did you know there was a time when LEGO was almost a thing of the past? During the late 90s to early 2000s, the LEGO group was struggling financially. At that point in time, they would create licensed sets for Star Wars, fresh off the Special Edition trilogy, and Harry Potter, fresh off the first movie, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Outside of that, they felt like they were out of touch. So they began experimenting in the action figure market. Gone was the idea of focusing on the LEGO brick, and now focusing on new parts and new ideas. There were two action figure lines made around the same time. Both were very similar to one another. A yin and yang, if you will. One, made in 2001, would become an extremely popular series that would continue on for many years. The other... Well, that's what we're looking at today. This is Galador, Defenders of the Outer Dimension. Galador follows Nick Bluetooth, played by Matthew Owald, a strange boy who lives with his grandfather, who has dreams of prophecy, seeing creatures from another world. On his 15th birthday, he finds a floating object in his room. He and his friend, Allegra Zen, played by Marie Marguerite Sabongui, discover that they found a map to a ship in the shape of an egg. It transports them to a deserted world called the Outer Dimension, where they encounter two aliens, an arch philosopher, who is the last amphibib, named Euripides, voiced by Georges Morris. That's not what I thought he'd grow into. No, no, not her. So, where is our young warrior? Didn't he fly this up here? No, I did. You! You almost killed us! A Sektari warrior named Nepal, voiced by Walter Massey. I hung on. And when it was over, I was... Short. I survived, but I had to live like this. <laughs> and a robot mechanic named Jens, voiced by Michael O'Reilly. Oh. It was sent to me, but I don't know how to read it. Of course, you're not Euripides. Back up a sec. Where on earth are we? Here. Where is here? Here? That's a stupid question. They prophesize that a warrior will find the hidden realm of Galador and save the outer dimension from the evil Gorm, voiced by Ian Finley. Have you or any of your slime-ridden tribe found anything? No, Master Gorm. Nothing down here. Search harder. You've left us with little moisture. We're too weak to go above. Caliphonic. You'll do what I tell you. And find a way home. Nick gains the ability to shapeshift his limbs into those of aliens and machines, known as the Glinch. No, no, the Glinch. That can help him in dire situations. The series lasted for two seasons with 26 episodes from February to August of 2002. It was produced by Cinegroup, based in Montreal, in association with YTV. Ever dream there's more to this boring old world than what they tell us? That instead of searching for new life far away, new worlds could exist in a dimension very close to our own? Nicholas is quickly learning that in the outer dimension, reality plays tricks. The outer dimension, filled with new friends, enemies, and this little blue guy. Hope Nick learns his way around in time to save the dimension and himself. Gee willikers, talk about a facial. Galador, coming soon. It was created by Thomas W. Lynch, with his production company, who have made prior to the series, Kids Incorporated, The Secret World of Alex Mack, and Caitlin's Way. Pretty successful shows in their time. It would air on YTV in Canada. It would also rerun on ABC Family, 
It would air on CBBC in the UK and was the last original show created for Fox Kids before being turned into the Fox Box. It would get a dedicated exhibit at Legoland, a comic book series, a McDonald's Happy Meal line, and a toy line that ran concurrently with the series. Every dimension needs a hero. Every hero needs a special power. In Galador, it's glinching. You can glinch to change form. Glinch to combine powers. Glinch to save Galador from Gorm. It's a power like nothing in this dimension. Galador, each sold separately. With all that said, how did the series do? Well, it failed. I, I told you he could drive. Tons of look out! <laughs> Hard. And there were many reasons for it. Despite getting a push for viewership by Fox Kids, it failed to pull in strong ratings in North America. When describing Yaldor's failings, it fell into multiple aspects. Lack of marketing, lack of television experience, and finally Disney's acquisition of Fox Family. The lack of marketing made it difficult for new customers to buy the new toys, despite many channels trying to push for the show's success, causing the toy line to be delayed and discontinued the same year it was put out on the shelf. So what were these Galador toys all about? They were action figures that could interchange their limbs to replicate the glitch. Knock it off! Basically, this sounds like a lot of fun for figures. Unfortunately, being a LEGO product, it didn't blend well with other LEGO products, which a lot of other sets did. The thing was, it felt like it was an action figure of the time, like the Incredible Crash dummies. That could be broken apart, but able to be put back together. Or this one He-Man monster, Modulok, which goes even farther back. It didn't feel like something LEGO would make. It felt like a trend chaser. Johnny Long Torso, Johnny Long Torso, the man who comes in pieces. He's long. In fact, there was a McDonald's Happy Meal toy line for Galador, which was a limb swap figure, but only split between three parts, head, body, and legs. But again, it felt like something other toys have done before. The other thing about this toy line was the more interesting aspect of it. One of the toys was LEGO's first game console, with the Keck Powerizer. In the show, there would be random white noise dispersed in episodes. However, it was actually an audio code that would be sent to the Powerizer that would unlock games and allowed kids to play along with the show. It would also work with the video game as well. There was an interview in 2013 with David Robertson, author of Brick by Brick, how LEGO rewrote the rules of innovation and conquered the global toy industry. Despite talking about a different LEGO toy line, it described the Galador toy line situation pretty well. There was a toy called Explore that was a line of toys for toddlers, and they were actually pretty good toys, just from my point of view. But they weren't very... Lego-y. They didn't have much construction as part of the toy. Lego tried to listen to its customers, which you're supposed to do, and they came out with a line of toys called Jack Stone, which was this minifigure crossed with G.I. Joe, this hero that would save the day. The thing is, these toys were really built for that child who didn't like Lego, which was the majority of kids. The company found from one study. These toys would snap together in about 10 minutes, and the kids could start playing. But a lot of us as parents, the reason we buy Lego for our kids, and we may not admit to it ourselves, it's that rainy Sunday afternoon when the kids are driving us nuts and we want a couple of hours of quiet. So we get the Lego sets. Well, if you bought the Jack Stone set, you would have 10 minutes and then the kids are running around screaming again. So it drove away some of the fans of the brand. Lastly, one of the experiments that Lego did during that time was something called Galador, a huge expensive failure. It was a buildable action figure, which there was a market for. What the company tried to do is something that we suggest here at Wharton, to try and create a full spectrum of innovation, a whole set of complementary innovations that will reinforce each other. Galdor wasn't just a toy, it had electronics in that you could play games in it, it had an accompanying video game, it had a TV show that would tell kids the story behind the toy. They did all kinds of marketing, so there'd be Galdor toys and McDonald's Happy Meals that would all build to create this unbeatable offer in the market. There was supposed to be a video game, but due to the toy's initial failure in the market, production was halted. However, the PC version of the game would be released afterwards, as well as a game on the Game Boy Advance, with versions on the GameCube and PS2 cancelled. LEGO Group's lack of experience when it comes to television made it obvious that while it was ambitious, they were not confident in the overall product. 
even years later, citing it as a Saturday morning cliché. With most of the critiques on the visual effects combining puppetry with amateur CGI, despite each episode having a huge budget of over a million in Canadian dollars, 620,000 US. In fact, to the production team's shock, the kids and critical reaction to the series was not a good departure from the series created prior by Lynch. Even many of the actors involved sadly didn't act much after this. It was that bad an experience for them. This was LEGO's second ever foray into television, with the first being 1987's Edward and Friends, based on the LEGO Fabuland line. Finally, with Fox Family being bought by Disney during Galdar's production, they were not confident in how they saw original productions on that network, as production staff assumed Disney bought the Fox Family Channel primarily for another show they just bought around that time, Power Rangers. For the first time ever, all 10 Red Rangers from all 10 seasons will unite. Ah, let's do it, guys. Four for top, one of power. Roll that thing. To save the world on a new Power Rangers Wild Force. Saturday morning, October 12th at 8.30, 7.30 Central. Then on Sunday, get supercharged with a Best of Power Rangers Red Ranger Marathon. All morning, part of Red Ranger Month on ABC Family. Potentially pouring its advertising into a well-established franchise that in some ways was similar to Galador. Do you want to know when they got the news of this buyout? Two months. Two months before the Galador brand would launch to the world. Despite Disney having a 2% share in Galador, it felt more like asking, why focus on the trend chaser in Galador when we have a trendsetter in Power Rangers? Surprising that we would be back to this topic. Disney might have thought, why have a trend chaser with Power Rangers in our repertoire when we have the trend setter in Marvel? It was a similar situation when they bought Lucasfilms and its treatment of their own sci-fi property, Tron. Why use Tron more when we have the trend setter in Star Wars? While Galador did air in reruns on ABC Family, it did not last long. In the outer dimension, Nick must lead good against Gorm. They're right on top of us! The map will show you the way. Check this out. You clinched! Nobody else can do that. This is gonna be great. Galador, next weekend at 11.30, 10.30 Central on ABC Family. The interesting thing about Galador was that it would gain a very small cult following and would get minor Easter eggs in future LEGO sets. In conclusion, Galador was seen as a learning experience for everyone involved, one that must be tread with caution. This is one of the ways how not to do a toy-based television series, or just a toy line in general. When it comes to LEGO-based shows and movies, they pretty much figure it out within the 2010s, including LEGO Ninjago, the LEGO movies, and LEGO Monkey Kid. Now, when we were talking about two toy lines that were like a yin and yang, what was the LEGO toy line that was released in 2001? A little toy line by the name of... Bionicle. Now this feels like a LEGO action figure line, with pieces, gears, and sprues that you can find in a LEGO Technic line, creating a body frame all topped off with unique masks. It feels like an action figure line that only LEGO could make. Bionicle was very successful, spawning video games, a Happy Meal line with frisbee throwing action, and a trilogy of directed DVD movies with action, lore, and stories that felt like they were written as a Shakespearean epic. Quite literally. Galador was released at the height of Bionicle's success and was basically in competition with themselves. Despite being absent for a while, it still has a following for a set commemorating Lego's 90th anniversary. When they provide the option to make a mini Toatahu out of Lego bricks, you know you made a toy line that will be known for years to come. What was seen as a failing toy icon. Now, Lego is seen as a juggernaut, making sets for practically everyone. And I think Toa Takanuva said it best. You're alive! Coolie head! You could have been bankrupt! Could have been, but I'm not. When we come back, we sound the call for the superhero of Kiddom. Next time on the YTV Retrospective. Powerful, brown, pink. It's Captain Flamingo. Tired of being a kid in a world built for grown-ups, Milo Powell decided to become a superhero. He's a shining peak of justice for kids everywhere. <laughs> He's 
got this flamingo. With his powerful novelty items. <laughs> and trusty sidekick Elizabeth. He's got this flamingo. Look out for the colorful and clueless Captain Flamingo. In Flamingo Vision, where available. Check this out. Hi, I'm George Booza, Beast on X-Men 97. And you might remember me from Maniac Mansion on YTV, and you're watching YTV Retrospective.